Hello, and thank you for joining us for the University of St. Francis Lecture Series, a virtual program of the Allen County Public Library. Tonight's program is entitled Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast. Michael Cahill will use actual case studies to illustrate how the transformation of culture was the linchpin to the dramatic turnaround in performance at multiple companies. He will also give a blueprint of how to accomplish this for your own organization. My name is Steve Miller. I'm a reference librarian here at the main library in the Business Science and Technology Department, and I will be the host for tonight's program. This program is being recorded for future viewing on YouTube, so in order to improve the quality of everyone's listening experience, your microphones have been muted. If you have a question or comment, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We will use chat to facilitate a question and answer period at the end of the program. The purpose of this lecture series is to prevent topics of interest and research information to the residents of Allen County and to provide a platform for the University of St. Francis faculty members to share their passion for the subjects with the library's patrons. And now I'd like to introduce Michael Cahill, Instructor of Financial Services and Program Director of Finance from the University of St. Francis. Michael. Steve, thank you very much. And thank you for joining me today. I'm not sure of having no live audience steadying my nerves or making them worse. We'll see as the program goes on. In the past few years, I've tried to pre stop presenting death by PowerPoint. Thus, you're stuck looking, listening to me rattle on and on and on with no other visual cues. The burden is on me to make this presentation engaging, interesting, without having to resort to slides that I need to read to you like most presentations take place. Further, before I begin, I want to give you some of my background so you know my perspective in sharing what I have to say today. This might be a little long because I'm a little old. I've been a, I have my bean counting degree from the University of Notre Dame, and I immediately went to work for Ernst & Young as a CPA firm right out of school. I'm not from Fort Wayne, but I moved my young family here in 1985. I've had careers in commercial real estate, health insurance, and banking. I've been fortunate enough to be a C-suite executive since I was 27 years old going forward. I was CFO of the various companies I was at from 1987 through 2005 and CEO of the various companies from 2006 until I retired and went to teach at University of St. Francis in 2021. From beyond that, I've also been a board member of many for-profit and not-for-profit entities. I can't keep the exact count, but it's somewhere around 25 companies. Nine of those, I was also chairman or vice chairman of the board to give me that perspective as well. From a size company, it has been from a low of about 50 employees all the way up to companies with over 3,000 employees. So hopefully, as I start sharing my experiences, you can kind of get the depth and breadth of where I come from when I present my talk on why culture eats strategy for breakfast. Before I get going, I do have something I want you to do and track as I speak. If you have a piece of paper, divide it in two. If you're sitting with a Word document in front of you, divide it into two sections. On one section, I want you to write down the following words. Culture, vision, mission, and values. And in that section of the paper, write in big capital letters, why. On the other section, I want you to write down strategic plan, budget, and tactics. And then in big capital letters, the word how. Now that you have that down, each time I say one of those buzzwords, put a little tally mark next to it, all right? It's our own little game of buzzword bingo as I go through my talk. If nothing registers in my speech, at least it will keep you engaged tracking me. Further, it will tie out to my thoughts that I will mention during my talk today, and we will revisit at the end of my talk. As I just said earlier, today I'm talking about culture, eat strategy for breakfast. When I say that, it does not mean that strategy is not important. It is meant to illustrate my belief that a great culture can overcome the lack of a strategy. Also, I do not believe that a bad culture can implement and execute on a great strategy. Let me start the discussion by taking an excerpt from Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, and I'm going to substitute the word strategic plan into it. Here we go. I have a strategic plan. It is a strategic plan deeply rooted in the American dream. 
I have a strategic plan that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a strategic plan that one day out of the red hills of Georgia, the sons of slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down at the table of brotherhood. I have a strategic plan that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering in the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a strategic plan that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by their character. I have a strategic plan today. Thank goodness Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream instead of a strategic plan. It is sure more inspiring. A dream is a vision. A vision is part of the culture of a company. A strategic plan is how to achieve the goals set out in the vision, the mission, and the values of an entity, whether it be a church, a not-for-profit, a for-profit entity, a family, or any type of entity or unit that you think about. No one is moved to action by a strategic plan. They are moved by a culture. Martin Luther King knew that when he used the word dream in the speech versus strategic plan. Thus, let's start with defining culture. Culture is the human representation and interaction that matches up with the entity's vision statement, mission statement, and values. The vision statement tells everyone what we want to be. It is the dream that Martin Luther King spoke about. The mission statement tells me who we already are, and the values tell us what is most important to all of us. These are not just words on a page, but allow us to set goals that tell us whether we're moving towards our vision, meeting our mission, and illustrating our commitment to our values. In Dr. King's speech, he did mention goals. Think about that. In the short excerpt I read, he mentioned the following. The nation will one day rise up and live the true meaning of its creed. To me, that means our entity, the United States, will live up to its values, which is part of your culture. Second, he sees the sons of both slaves and slave owners sitting down together at the same table of brotherhood. He speaks to the value of equality before each other being met. He sees oppression being transformed into freedom and justice. He finishes by saying he sees a nation meeting his vision when it is the content of our character that matters, not the color of our skin. His speech was a vision that has to be proven out by the way we live our values. He has set its goals through his vision. The culture is about living the vision, set forth in pursuit of measurable goals outlined. It tells us why we do what we do, how we measure ourselves against that why statement. The strategic plan is just a roadmap illustrating how that vision will be attained. The culture is the petri dish that, ha that the strategic plan is put into that allows the vision or dream to manifest itself. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It's been, it's been my experience that business schools spend a lot of time teaching analyzing and focusing on strategic planning. I do not want to shortchange this import, the importance of having a solid strategic plan. However, without the appropriate culture, the ability to implement the, any plan begins to crumble. The purpose of my talk today is to explain not only why culture is even more important than the strategic plan, but to how to truly create the culture you desire. First, let me start with two stories that I was a party to in order to gauge how culture is felt or manifested. Years ago, a woman knocked on my office door one afternoon when I was the CEO of a local bank. She said she had just moved to town and selected our bank and wondered if I wanted to know why. Well, of course I did, so I invited her in. She said she had visited the main branch of all the banks here locally. She was from the West Coast, so she was unfamiliar. And she said after watching activity for about 15 minutes at each of the banks, she decided that the bank I was at was the right bank. So I said, well, what was it that you experienced that made that the case for you? She said, everyone that walked by me 
had a smile on their face. At the same time, they were moving quickly like they had to do something right then, but every single one of them took the time out to stop and ask if they could help me. That told me everything I needed to know about your bank. This tells me that when the culture of a company is ingrained, everyone can feel it. It helps attract the right employees, students, benefactors, customers, suppliers, you name it. It also helps push away those that would do better in another culture or situation. Second story, joined the same bank. They were huge when I got there on their mission statement. They started every meeting with it and a story related to it. Once a year, they would go off site and revisit the mission statement to see if something had to be changed. The year before I got there, there had been a big embezzlement, so they added the word integrity to the mission statement. Anyhow, I'd been there about three months when they went off site again. At the time, in the middle of the mission statement, it said, team members, customers, community, and shareholders, and it was in that order. And they asked, is there anything we need to change about our mission statement? And I spoke up and said, I believe we need to move customers ahead of team members. I then heard a very impassioned speech about why team members purposely come in front of customers. And I sat there and said, well, you know what? Let's just be honest. That's not what we do. Since I've been at this bank, every time a phone call comes into an office or into somebody's cell phone, if we're in front of a team member, we take that call. That tells me the customer is truly most important to us. So why not, why not make that number one? Many companies do that. There's nothing wrong with it. Let's make sure that our values and how we act are congruent. Then something amazing took place. Something that sticks with me to this day. They decided to change the behavior. They stopped answering the phone in front of the team member. They stopped taking the cell phone in front of the team member. They really meant what they said in their mission statement and they changed the behavior to illustrate it. We are all human. We will fall short. It does not mean that we do not believe in our purpose or our values. We just need to be reminded sometimes. Someone told me that the constant striving towards the unattainable goal of perfection, excellence is achieved. I think that pertains to that story here. So what exactly is culture and how do we know we are actually living it? How do we keep it from being just words on a paper? To me, there are three foundational building blocks to a culture that I have mentioned. They are the vision statement, mission statement, and company values. The, very, the values are the very base of the culture. The mission statement is built upon those values, and the vision statement is built upon the mission statement. All right, now that I think about it, that would have made a great slide. I should have brought it in for that, but hopefully you can picture that. Let me explain this in greater detail. The vision statement is aspirational. It's what we aspire to be. The mission statement tells us who we are now, and the values tell us what is important to us. And putting these together, you have created your why statement. Simon Sinek has great videos, TED Talks, and books on the why. The why statement basically tells us why you do what you do and how that benefits society in the broadest terms. Think of the difference in your why statement or culture versus a strategic plan by using the words of Martin Luther King Jr. that I started this talk with. Let's look into some vision statement examples. A physician's health plan is to create innovative solutions that contribute to healthier communities through caring and collaboration. At the AWS Foundation is to think differently about disabilities. Finally, at the Northeast Indiana Regional Partnership, it is the relentless pursuit of progress. These tell everyone how they should be looking at the work they do in furtherance of the vision. Instead of a long-winded strategic plan, these vision statements help us decide on what to do. At PHP, the words creative and innovative ring true. They want this work to benefit society by creating healthier communities. Finally, it is to be done collaboratively and in a caring manner. At the regional partnership, 
It's about the relentless pursuit of progress. However, people need a way to measure progress toward that vision. A vision statement is fine, but people need to know if they're making progress. At the regional partnership, they distilled the vision down to the following three measures or goals. You can go out to the website. These are right there. Number one, they want to have Northeast Indiana's per capita personal income reach 90% of the U.S. average. They want to have 1 million people living in the 11 counties of Northeast Indiana. They want 60% of the workforce to have credentials beyond high school. And lastly, all three of those goals would be achieved by the year 2030. Not only does everyone know why these goal, what these goals are, they know why they support the vision and why they're in place. So let me show you why they're in place and why all the employees know it. Our region used to have per capita personal income in excess of 100% of the U.S. average. But we're part of the Rust Belt economy, and as time went on, we got as low as 80% and we're going lower. They know they have to have a goal to set out, so they set it at 90%. We wanted to make sure that the companies coming to the region and growing were about the future of the economy, not the past. In doing the research, they found that companies would relocate in areas that had a million people in population. Therefore, we need to have a million people. And besides, they say, if you're not growing, you're dying, let's make sure we grow. And finally, in any economics class, human capital is what makes things run. And in today's economy, you need to have post-secondary credentials of some sort and that's why they set the 60%. All these tie together. And at the end, there has to be a date out there, 2030. So we know that the vision statement is why we do what we do, and that every vision needs measurable goals and a time frame. Do not mistake the goals and the time frame for a strategic plan. We will get to that later. The mission statement is who we are and what is important to us now. An example of a mission statement is to help children and adults with enduring intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities live as independently as possible and be included in the community and function of, at their highest potential. This tells every employee at the AWS Foundation what it is about every day they show up for work. You combine this with a vision statement about thinking differently about disabilities, and you can feel that why statement and purpose really coming into focus. That mission statement will also have some measurables, just like the vision statement. However, these will be much shorter term in nature and tell us what we need to accomplish maybe in the next year or two. I know in the past, when I was the CEO at the AWS Foundation, when the vision and mission statements were put together, we had a few goals for the mission statement. The big goal was we wanted to be make, able to make grants in excess of $5 million a year. At the time, they were making grants of $600,000 a year. That was the vision. From a mission standpoint, here's what the three goals were. Restructure the financing of the foundation so they're not acting as the bank for their for-profit subsidiary, so those monies are available for grant making. Second, add one more. There's three grant making cycles. Let's make it four. That will increase the ability to make grants. And lastly, hey, this year we're going to make grants of a million and a half bucks, so Let's get out there and make it happen, right? All steps in the right direction. These goals, just like the goals for the vision statement, tell us what we want to accomplish in furtherance of the mission, but it does not tell you how. The strategic plan is how to achieve goals, not why the goals were set. Finally, values tell everyone what is important to us. Typically, if you were to join a company, after about 90 days, you should probably be able to ascertain what those real values are, whether they're written or not. I find myself doing that naturally these days wherever I go. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I look to see if they have written values and see if it matches up to what I've observed. There are tons and tons of great values, but you'd really narrow it down to no more than five that we focus on. These should reflect who you are, and in some cases, they might be aspirational because as you look at your vision and mission statement, you see something that might be missing. All right? When I joined PHP, they had been in business for about 30 years, and there were values there, but nothing was written down. 
So I gave a list of 400 potential values to all the employees and said, tell me what you think the top four are. When the results all came in, they really narrowed it down to about seven. <laughs> Amazingly, right? 400 pick to seven. And they settled on the following four. Number one, collaboration. We are an agile team that identifies and implements strategic solutions. Two, integrity. We act and speak honestly and ethically. Three, development. We provide opportunities for employees' growth both personally and professionally. And four, social purpose. We are committed to philanthropy, actively involved and supportive of the communities we serve. In looking at these, after creating the vision and mission statement, a new value was added. It was added because part of the vision and mission really did not describe PHP at that time. However, everyone knew it was something that had to be embraced. This value was as follows. Number five, innovation. We embrace an environment that encourages free thinking, new ideas, and a nimble response. If you remember, the vision statement for PHP that I shared above was quite creative, was to create innovative solutions that contribute to healthier communities through caring and collaboration. The vision, mission, and values need to hang together. The mission is built on the values, and the vision is built on the mission. These are absolutely foundational. And I found that in every case of everywhere I've gone. They need to become second nature. So repetition is crucial. I have seen boards of companies read the vision, mission, and value statement before every board meeting. I've been at companies where they read them before every team meeting or all employee gathering. However, there's one crucial part of bringing these to life. These are the stories that illustrate the culture, how someone lived up to the vision, mission, and values. People remember stories. Repetition combined with stories that illustrate the culture become part of who we are. You should not have to look at any piece of paper after a while to be able to know what the culture of the company is. When you get even stronger as an organization where everyone is in lockstep in belief of the culture, you can share stories about where you fell short and how you're gonna get back on track. The story I shared about the bank changing its culture on phone calls is a great example of that. Stories personalize things. They make things memorable and they reinforce the culture. They create a feeling. Feelings are remembered far better than words on a paper. The why engages the heart. There is a quote that says, if you want to capture the mind, you must capture the heart first. Further, many times when difficult decisions are to be made as CEO, the strategic plan really was of no use to me. In life, there are many constituencies we try to keep happy all at the same time. It could be our spouse, our kids, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, our bosses, our customers, and on and on and on. Amazingly, we can balance this out about 90 to 95% of the time. However, occasionally we must pick. To me, the vision, mission, and values are the guiding light in these cases. Let me use a couple of illustrations. At home, in the past year with COVID going on, family stresses were at an all-time high, as you can imagine. And there was differences of opinion between my wife and a few of the kids. I had to make a choice between my wife and my kids. There was no middle ground. I chose my wife, she comes first. Now, if my wife had to do the choosing, I think I'd come after the kids, the grandkids, and the dog, but that's beside the point. For at least we know what to do when we must. It is the vision, mission, and values that help us during these most difficult decisions, not a strategic plan. I know that I prioritize my family, but if push comes to shove, it starts with my life partner of 38 years. Additionally, life will throw curveballs at you that are not in any strategic plan. At PHP, we had added the value of innovation that I shared earlier, but it's not really practiced. It had to be focused on. Out of nowhere, an unusual opportunity came up. USA Gymnastics, which has issues, as most of us know, with sexual abuse of many of the gymnasts throughout the country by coaches, had some issues. They approached PHP to build and operate a hotline for gymnasts all over the country to call in 
obtain counseling and related services on a confidential basis. PHP is a health insurance company. This was outside any strategic plan or direction for the company. PHP did it in anyhow. It did it for the following reasons. Number one, it forced a lot of innovation on a collaborative basis. And two, it was based on caring and community. It hit on the vision statement and the new value. What better way to illustrate how PHP was committed to its vision, mission, and values, in other words, culture, to take on that project, even though it did not meet any strategic planning tactics or defined goals of the company? I have had many difficult decisions where the culture helped me considerably in making a decision. At the bank I was at, we had a very talented and dedicated employee who fell for an email scam that resulted in a customer having funds stolen. If that was the only thing that had happened, nothing would happen to the employee other than training. Instead, they started to cover it up. They created fraudulent paperwork, covered up, coerced others to sign off on things, etc. This employee was a superior performer for us over many years. What happened did not benefit them at all financially. However, the company had had an embezzlement when things were covered up that led to the word integrity being added to the mission statement. There had also been many other transgressions of various, of various natures that suggested who did it had a lot to do with how it was handled. The culture had to be lived for everybody. Thus, I let the employee go. At the same time, I knew they had learned a very hard lesson, would never do it again. Thus, I gave a reference for them, and they never missed a paycheck. This accomplished two things. It illustrated that the values, mission, and vision applied to everyone equally. It also illustrated that one highly visible mistake by a high performer would not preclude me from helping them out. As an aside, and this is a big piece of culture to me, the initial act is almost never worse than the cover-up. If you can create a culture where quickly admitting mistakes and taking responsibility is part of the core, the cover-ups have a much lower chance of taking place. Unfortunately, that culture had not yet been embedded at the bank at the time, but it would be. The cover-up cover -up was the cause of the firing, not the mistake. It was a learning moment for the team and the culture. I revisited the same company when I saw the CEO and board start to drift from its vision, mission, and values. It was not the strategic plan it was drifting from. The growth focus and customer service focus and metrics were being tracked and followed. However, how it was being done was called into question. Also, senior management had been quietly trying to sell the company along with a few board members. This was being done to try and hide a lot of bad loans, and poor management decisions. Getting back to the foundation of vision, mission, and values would allow the company to get back on track. Thus, a special board meeting was called to air all of this out. The board, after an appropriate deliberation, got the bank back to its roots. On the day the bank made that leadership change, the stock was trading at under $4 a share. Five years later, it was trading at $24 a share. Yes, some of that was due to modifications of the strategic plan, but most of it was attributable to getting back to why the bank was started, its vision, its mission, and its values. Reestablishing the culture and, the, and living that entity's why allowed that vision to be obtained. Another illustration on a smaller basis. There was a product created many years ago by the U.S. Congress called Health Savings Accounts. The same bank needed to track customer deposits. A vision and mission statement for the product was created. The vision was to be the insurance broker's partner in providing high deductible health plans to small business. The mission was to provide education to the brokers and their clients and provide low-cost health savings account that was all electronic. A separate team was created with its own culture that was like the bank, but focused. There was a strategic plan that accompanied it as well. It had to do with how it was staffed, how the technology would work, how the various related items and deposit products would work together. Several other banks copied the staffing, the technical details, and every part of the strategic plan. However, they did not have a vision or mission. 
or in other words, they didn't have a culture to support it. Competitors used existing personnel to do the same duties and tactics, but they didn't have the culture. The results? The bank I was at became the 18th largest provider of health savings accounts in the country out of 12,000 banks, credit unions, and fintech companies that could issue those accounts. It wasn't the strategy. It was all about the vision and mission. As can be ascertained by the above, there was a strategic plan in each case, but it supported the vision, mission, values, and related goals. It brings me to a quote from Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. A nicer quote on the same topic is from Robert Frost. It goes as follows. The, the afternoon knows what the morning never suspected. Now at this juncture, you may be asking if I'm against strategic planning. No, not at all. I believe strongly in strategic planning. However, you can never plan for everything that happens. People will not remember all the parts of a strategic plan. Many times, people do best if they know what they are, trying, what they are shooting for and in a nimble manner react to it. If, as Mike Tyson says, you get punched in the mouth. Or as Robert Frost says, you now know something in the afternoon that you knew nothing about in the morning. Culture adapts to events on the fly. Strategic plans do not. Culture is a common knowledge about why all of us exist as part of an entity. That is something that can be embedded and remembered because it is felt deep. A strategic plan is a group of well thought out tactics to achieve what the culture is in place to do. There is a story that best illustrates this. There was an engineering class at a Midwestern university, and they were told when they came to class to make sure that they had the clothes, money, and a car for a week. When they got to the class, they were split into two teams. They were given a dress in Los Angeles, California that they needed to get to. This was before the smartphone, before giving out to the internet, having all these maps, before all that time. One group took out the time to get out the maps, plan the route, which hotels they're gonna stay at, where they're gonna get gas, all those type things. The other group knew Los Angeles was west and immediately headed out and just moved and adapted as time went on. They both got to Los Angeles, California, but it was the group that just set out and knew what they were doing, knew their why, that got there first. We must be nimble enough to change plans when things change. Roads close, hotels are full, gas stations are not open 24 hours. You cannot plan for every eventuality. Culture tells us what our guiding principles are. And when the plan fails us, or situations change, it makes us nimble. I wanna finish with two more stories of companies headquartered in this region. I won't name them, but you may be able to guess who they are. Both are extremely successful companies with extremely distinct cultures. I know for a fact that neither has ever had an annual budget. They do have deeply embedded cultures and goals. The first is incredibly customer focused. I used to work at many companies I felt were very customer focused, but this company takes it to another level. It is all about the customer and knowing as much as possible about them and constantly modifying the approach to the customer to optimize the experience and the relationship. Second, the salespeople are all personally involved in that industry. They are customers of the company as well. They can feel what the customer feels. Yes, they have many moving parts that they're good at as well, but it's all about the customer and the person talking to the customer, knowing how they feel. When I first met the owner of this company, back in about 2005, they were doing about 65 million in annual sales. Last year, they almost did 1.5 billion. It was the culture that allows them to adapt and grow, even with no budget, which is at the heart of many strategic plans. The second story is similar, but with its own twist. The customer focus is hauntingly similar. They treat the salespeople as customers as well. However, this is where there's a divergence. Everyone else knows that whatever the customer or the salesperson wants goes, period, as long as it's legal, of course. The HR staff, the accounting staff, 
the marketing staff, the facility staff, the support staff of all types must do everything in their power to serve those people. In any argument, the customer or salesperson wins. No question about it. How does the culture deal with the seemingly inequitable treatment of everyone other than the salespeople? How do you do that in an organization? Two ways. The non-sales staff are paid handsomely. In many cases, twice the what they could make anywhere else. Second, that extra pay tracks with the success of the salespersons. They might not like how they count out to the salesperson, but they know that they are in lockstep with them and how the success of the salesperson benefits them directly. Now, this is a very money-driven place, but everyone knows this and wants it. It is the culture. At the same time, it is all about the end customer. So everyone knows that the cause they are fighting for, a quality product at a very fair price, delivered in a fast manner and a very transparent process. I watched this company go from 18 employees in 2007 to over 1,000 today. Once again, they have never had a budget. I can also tell you they've never had a strategic plan. They have always had a culture and know what goals they were trying to achieve. The culture allows them to achieve it. You can feel the culture in both places by just spending a day there. Culture is something that everyone can participate in, feel pride in, and know if they are making a difference in what they do. Many times the strategic plan is understood and followed by senior management, but most people in an organization have a set of tasks they are told to do and complete without knowing how it fits into that plan. Let's go back to the AWS Foundation. The vision statement is to think differently about disabilities. The mission statement is to help children and adults with enduring intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities live as independently as possible, be included in the community, and function at their highest potential. Every employee can know at the end of each day if what they did that day furthered that vision and mission. Better yet, it allows them to think outside of their day-to-day -day job when things happen around them that further the mission and vision. So in summary, just because I say culture beats strategy for breakfast, it does not mean that having an appropriate strategy is not an important component of success. I just believe that without the right culture in place, the ability to, be react, to react to being punched in the face, the environment changing, or knowing why you're doing what you're doing, you will fail. The why statement allows you to look around, adapt, and expand. The how statement tells you what to do. It keeps your head down. You may miss something if you're just focusing on the strategic plan of how. On the other hand, even if you did have a strategy, budget, whatever, but everyone knew what the vision and mission, along with the goals were, like the last two companies I spoke about, they would collaborate on the fly and have a much higher chance of getting it done. At the end of the day, I want both. However, if I must choose one, culture is my choice every time. I've also found that culture is the competitive advantage most times. It is what can be sustained. Plans change, but keeping the culture is crucial. Now, let's visit, revisit buzzword bingo. Let's take a look at your tally. In my talk today, I talked about the importance of repetition combined with stories. If you want to create a culture, not only do you have to have written values and their definition, but a written mission, written mission and vision statement and related goals. That is not enough. It is about re repetition that is augmented by stories. It is those stories that ingrain the culture. I imagine your cup runneth over next to the words vision, mission, and values. Next would be culture. Hopefully this leaves a lasting impression and an easy roadmap to create and implement a culture. If nothing else, if a 30-minute talk can leave that impression, imagine what a year or two of this type of culture building would do in your organization. I want to thank you all for listening. And I want to thank the Allen County Public Library for allowing me to speak. As I heard on a Southwest, Southwest Airlines flight one time, if you like what you heard, tell everyone. If not, let's make this our little secret. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That's very sure. interesting. I have several questions, but one came through on our chat already from a viewer, so I'll read that here first. Sure. And that is, how often would a company's values be revised? My personal values seem to be lifelong values. I think that last statement says it all. I don't think values change at a company at the end of the day. 
even if you're adding one that is aspirational, there's a reason you put it there. So I would think that would be very, very rare. Mm -hmm. A couple things I, that I was wondering just from, from hearing your talk, uh, the story about the bank and changing the way they prioritized phone calls, mm -hmm. uh, th did you set about to change that back? <laughs> no, no, I, I, in all honesty, uh, when I went in after three months, I understood why they said team members first, and I didn't disagree with it. They just didn't live it. And so I assumed, you know what? Maybe that did change. Maybe you really want customers first. And I just brought it up. But what really stuck with me is they meant it. When you change your behavior <laughs> amongst that many people, that tells me they really believed in that mission. Like all of us were determined they got away from it. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was wondering about, when you talked about you, you came back, I forget which place it was, with 400. Oh, <laughs> values. <laughs> values, that's an off, I mean, you had 350, like, no, I've still got a lot more to, I mean, what, how could you come up with that many values? Uh, it, uh, it was actually something that was on a piece of paper, and I purposely did it because the company had been in business for 35 years when I got there, and I knew it had a distinct set of values, mm -hmm. but I wanted to prove it to myself by giving all the employees all these choices right. and see how they narrowed it down. And it's amazing when you have 200 people look at 400 values, and basically 90% of them came up with the same seven. When I looked at those seven, a lot of them were very similar. Mm -hmm. It just told me how powerful those values were to the company. So I didn't have to do anything about it, just write them down on a piece of paper, or are you living in it? Right. I was interested that you mentioned that Southwest Airlines right at the end, because one of the things I looked up uh, in, in advance of this talk was, you know, you put in Google search on culture and businesses, and uh, a common quote is, culture is what people do when no one is looking supposedly by the head of Southwest Airlines. And that's kind of a controversial statement because several people out there agreed with it. Several other people said, you know, no, the culture it should be what people, how you're acting when people are watching. So I wonder what, what your take on that I, quote I think, was. I, I like when people aren't watching. That tells me it's embedded. It's like anything else. I can, per, I can act a certain way for a certain period of time when all eyes are upon me, but culture is who I am. So I don't have to adapt who I am mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So I believe extremely strongly in that because it's really what's gonna happen when I'm not watching. Those are things that make me nervous as CEO. Mm -hmm. But if I know it's embedded, I don't worry about that right. at all. And it allows me to give people more freedom. And don't we all, at the end of the day, don't we want, you know, the word empowered, I kind of hate it because you hear it all the time, but it's a, it's a meaningful word. If I know they agree with the vision, mission, and values, and they live it out, and they know what our goals are. You know what? They might get there a different way than I do, but they're gonna get there, and I'm happy to let them do it. <laughs> so I was wondering, how much does the personality or ethics of the top person set the tone for the entire organization? It's huge. I, I can't speak enough about it. And don't go wrong, we're all human. We have our moments. And I, and I think that's the key thing for the person top. They have to be a manifestation of those that vision, mission, and values, and recognize when they fall short, admit it, be accountable to it, and correct it. We're all human, we're gonna make mistakes. Right. But I'll tell you what, having that uh, ability to be that vulnerable as the head of a company is huge. Because if, if they don't, it's just words on a piece of paper, and it won't take place. Right. So it's obviously, it's kind of more fun in a way to, to talk about, or easier to find information about um, the failures, the ones, the things that went, you know, Enron's, Lehman Brothers, mm -hmm. the, the Better.com guy firing people on Zoom, oh. uh, that type of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you were brought into a company that was that level of, of problems, what, how would you address changing the culture, if, if, if at all possible? Two of the companies that I mentioned, that's what I was brought in to do, mm -hmm. was we have to change the culture and it was kind of interesting, what I found in every case, and, and I've done this every time, is if you get back to helping people realize what that why statement is, and you start sharing the stories, and people start react to it, two things happen. The people that don't fit that culture, leave on their own. And the people that are living the culture attract people into the company that are already following that culture, and you become stronger because of it. And in every case, I have found that that was so much more important than the strategy. Don't get me wrong, we had a strategy. But every day, 
We're all doing hundreds of different things. We don't know what's coming through the phone, coming through the email, coming through the text. If I know our vision, our mission, our values, and our, and, you know, our basic goals, we're all smart folks. We'll take that action. Mm -hmm. But it's, I'll tell you what, it's tough, and it takes about a couple of years. It's not something you can do overnight. My experience has been it's been a couple of years to make that happen. So obviously, we're two middle-aged white males who've probably had a lot of privilege in our lives. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for women who are watching or, or uh, minorities who are watching, they might say, you know, the culture is great at this place if you're right. a straight white male, but maybe not so good for women or people of color and things like that. So, you know, there's been the Me Too movement, the United mm -hmm. Front initiative. Things may be changing somewhat, but it's. Um, how would you, what would you say to those folks who are thinking, well, sure. it's easy for you to say because... Oh, no, the, the, yeah. no, it's a, it's a great question, but th there's bad cultures, right? The things you're talking about, that, that's a bad part of the culture, right? And to today's age, we're looking for people. Companies are going to have to change some of their cultures to do it. And what I always tell people is when you first start out, especially when you're trying to move up the ladder, instead of looking, the company culture is great, if, right? But who your boss is is going to make a bigger impact on your life, initially especially, than the company itself. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very fortunate. You talk about privilege, I'm going to take away the fact that I am, as David Finley at Lake City would say, I'm stale, male, and pale, <laughs> okay, at the end, is the people I work for are what really set the trajectory of my career. Not, the, yes, the opportunities with the company, but it was those people. And I try to always remind myself of that. And there's lots of good people out there. Maybe that person has the values that you admire, the vision that you admire. Maybe the company doesn't, but find that person. All right? And a big piece of it is we need to have women and minorities in positions of leadership that people can follow and see. Because as much as we talk about it, we want, if we see someone like ourselves have success, we're more than likely to follow that. That's a big challenge. Uh, if you'll indulge me for a minute, this will sure. take a little longer to read, but I, I came across this article. Uh, it was you know, talking about basically the, the great resignation that we're kind of mm -hmm. experiencing right now. And there was some kind of survey. It says a survey of over 2,000 employed Americans found 59% have con contemplated quitting their jobs enough to have the letter ready to go, but haven't followed through with sending it yet. And it said nearly 9 in 10, or 88% of workers who quit their jobs said they would have stayed if their employer offered better benefits, such as having more opportunities for growth, better working conditions, or having internal career development. And uh, the president of the person who's of someplace called Wisetail said, we're seeing a massive shift in priorities. Potential employees are being more vocal about what they want out of a job, whether that means having more mental health days, better pay, or intangible benefits, almost as much as Almost as many, 61%, wish they had more responsibilities at work than they currently do, and 57% feel the need to go job hunting because their bosses aren't offering what they need. Six in 10 would, take an, would even take an average 14% pay cut if it meant working in an better environment. Whether they're searching for work or not, three in four people believe their ideal job would be with a company that aligns with their personal values. Ultimately, people want to be heard. When people feel like their needs aren't being addressed or met, they're more likely to look elsewhere where the needs can be met. Once they find a company where their values align, people find themselves feeling happy with what they do. So if you comment on that. Sure. Um. Uh, in all honesty, I think those percentages, within reason, wouldn't be any different 10 or 20 years ago. There's a big difference, though, with the great resignation. There's such a demand for labor. There are more positions than there are people. That's a big shift uh, overall, and people are starting to take hold of that at the end of the day. And the other thing is, what people put on a piece of paper, a lot of people don't always follow through on. And that's always frustrating to me. Mm -hmm. I know what someone's unhappy in this job. They've talked about it. But I've seen time and time again, and, and I understand this, the dollars and cents make a difference. Yeah, I'd take, a, I'd take a pay cut, but I can't afford to take a pay cut. You know, I got kids. I got other responsibilities. I, got pay, I mean, I hate it, <laughs> but I feel stuck. That's when have, finding mentors. And if you can't find it in your boss, Find mentors. What I always tell people, you are the five people you surround yourself with. And keep that in mind. If I can't find it at work, is there a person that you know or admire that will take some time with you? All right? I don't care who it is. I think that will take people a little farther than they want to go. 
But the good thing is, it's happening. Right? It's forcing change. When you talk about you know, the privilege we've had, this economy is changing how people need to adapt and adapt their cultures and do the right thing. Mm -hmm. My take. Yeah. yeah, thank you. If anyone else has any questions, uh, please send them in right away here on chat, or although it will be wrapping up here. Um, if not, do you have anything else you want to sum up um, or saying? No, I, I want to just build on that last point a little bit yeah, sure. for anyone watching is it is so frustrating because you're at an employer and you can't find that right boss or right situation. You feel trapped. That five person thing I'm, is, is meaningful. If you almost have, think about it as your own personal board of directors, you know, people that maybe model the way for you and you know they care about you and can open up your network, help you work through things. It doesn't have to be your boss. It doesn't have to be your family member. And what I've found is if you just ask, people are more than willing to help out. I've been just been so fortunate that way. Take away my boss. I've just, you know, you see someone and you just spend some time with them and they're always grateful for the time spent and I'm more than grateful for mm -hmm. the time they spend on me. Yeah. My, my two Great. cents. Thank you. So, Please join us for the next University of St. Francis lecture on Wednesday, March 23rd at 6.30 p.m. when Dr. Mario Baldessari will present Would You Be a Good Witness? This will be a live program, fingers crossed, in the Main Library Theater. If you are interested in that program or, or our other upcoming programs for adults, children, and teens, please visit the Allen County Public Library website at www.acpl.info where you will find a comprehensive listing of events under the Events tab located at the top of the homepage. Most of the events ask that you register in advance, so please take note of that. If you have any additional follow-up questions or comments regarding the information shared today or are in need of additional resources, please contact, contact us at ask at acpl.info. On behalf of Michael and the staff at Access Fort Wayne, thank you for attending today's program and have a good evening.